So here's an example of uh, how we can use electron diffraction in a practical way. Uh, this example here I'm going to be talking about uh, has something to do with, uh, let's, let's just say we, we have a little, you know, uh, little square right here. And this could be some sort of crystal. So a lot of times you know, we're trying to actually get electrons to uh, diffract across something. So let's just say this is, maybe this is graphite, some sort of crystal here. What we actually do is we um, accelerate these electrons through some sort of potential difference here. So this is some sort of voltage here. These little electrons kind of go flying this way. They fly into the crystal. And the idea is that we want these electrons to be diffracting uh, through sort of holes in the crystal. Now in order to do that, uh, in order to have diffraction, your electron wave needs to travel through a gap uh, around, around the same order as its wavelength. So roughly the same you know, wavelength as your electron. Now your spacing in your crystal uh, that provides those gaps. So if they hit uh, you know, this crystal right here and the spacing is roughly uh, at least on the same order as the wavelength, then they can actually diffract, which means if they do that, um, let's just say this is in 3D, so to speak. So I'm going to try to draw you sort of like what a screen would look like here. Of course, this whole situation could be like some big tube right here. You could have like some sort of experimental setup. So if we have these things right here, you'd actually see these electrons would end up, you know, some of them would go in the middle and they would make sort of like a bright ring in the middle. And then, uh, maybe I'll draw these a different color here. And then you'd have sort of a bright ring of where you'd see your electrons here. And then maybe you see like another ring that's maybe less bright and then another ring that's maybe less bright here. Uh, so you'd see something like this right here happening. So you'd see some sort of diffraction pattern here, where again, this is a maximum, then a wide open minimum, and another maximum. Of course, I didn't draw these very nicely because they're supposed to look less and less bright. So this middle would be bright, then less bright, then less bright, and so on. So this is that sort of question here that we're trying to solve. So if we look at this, then we can say, well, what's the kinetic energy of these electrons? The voltage, by the way, that's three, uh, it's like 2,000 volts. That's what it is, two times 10 to the three. So what's their kinetic energy? Well, we can go hunt for our trusty equation sheet here, and we need to find an equation for the kinetic energy and this is again the kinetic energy of electrons that have been accelerated. So VE is half mv squared. So again, we can go back to that one. So their kinetic energy, EK, let's say, is V times E. Which in our case, if we want that, well, we can put in the voltage, which is 2,000 volts. That's our potential difference. Our charge of our electron, if we're not sure about that, we can always look it up on the equation sheet. Here it is, elementary charge, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 And if we do that on our trusty old calculator here, if I wanted to show you everything exactly how I would do it, so just in case you weren't sure. So 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, I multiply that by 2,000, and I get uh, something like 3.2 times 10 to the minus 16. So I get something like that. So 3.2 times 10 to the minus 16. And the units of kinetic energy are joules. And the next question right here wants me to find the characteristic wavelength. Remember, wavelength is lambda. So I can use my equation from quantum mechanics. Uh, go to that page over here. So I can use P equals H over lambda. That's what I want to try to find. Okay, so I use this P equals H over lambda. So I want lambda by itself, so I move that up here, so I get lambda equals h over p. Great, I'm all set. If only I knew the momentum. But it turns out kinetic energy, which I just found here, and that was ek, kinetic energy helps me to find momentum. That's because there exists an equation that relates uh, kinetic energy and momentum. So let's go hunt for that one. If you're not sure where to find uh, equations for kinetic energy, then maybe we can start looking at the first topics here in mechanics. People's most common one for kinetic energy is this one, half mv squared. But one that a lot of students forget to use is the one right below it. Look at this one. Ek is p squared over 2m. That's to do with momentum. So p squared over 2m, that's ek. Now we use that one. Okay, so ek equals p squared over 2m. That's the mass of the electron. And you see how I know EK? EK is this number, so I've got that. I basically just got to get P by itself here. So if I get P by itself, I move the 2M to the top here, so I get 2M times kinetic energy. Of course, I have to take the square root. 
So if I take that P and I put it into here, then I'll get an equation that relates everything I need. So lambda will be H over 2 times mass of the electron times the kinetic energy and the square root. Keep in mind, you could have actually found the momentum on your own you know, by actually finding that first and then doing it. But I like to do everything all at once. So let's put in all our numbers. H is 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules seconds, of course. And we'll divide that by, let's see, the square root of 2 times, I need the mass of the electron. In case you don't know that by heart, you can always look it up in your equation sheet. Second page of your equation sheet, we have the mass of an electron when it's at rest. We're talking about non-relativistic uh, issues here, so we'll talk about its rest mass. So it's roughly uh, 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So I'll put that in. times my kinetic energy, which I found before was 3.2 times 10 to the minus 16. And if I do all of this right here, let's do it on our calculator. So let's say I'll use this uh, answer here, this bottom one here. I'm actually going to do this bottom part first, then I'm going to do this number divided by my answer. So 3.2 times 10 to the 16, I want to multiply that by 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31. And then I multiply that by 2. I take the square root of my answer. And I take this and I want to do 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. I want to divide it by my answer from these two lines. That gets me my wavelength. So I'm allowed two significant figures here. Because remember we said 2.0 times 10 to the 3 uh, volts. Remember that up here. So we're only allowed two significant figures, that's why I use two here. So in my case right here, since I'm only allowed two significant figures, I will say two point, well it depends how you want to round this up. You could say you can, this rounds up to a five and that means this rounds up. So you could say something like 2.8 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. Remember what we talked about before? Uh, before we were talking about how this thing here will only diffract if the you know, spacing between the atoms is roughly the on the order of the wavelength of uh, your particles that you're using. If we use visible light, remember, that would have been, let's say, 600 nanometers, which is 600 times 10 to the minus 9, which is way too big for an atom. Remember, the size of an atom is roughly, uh, we we're talking about it here, it's about 10 to the minus 10. So if we look at electrons, remember here before I said much smaller wavelength, well, now we've actually quantified that. We've sort of filled in the blank here. How much smaller wavelength? on the order of 10 to the minus 11 meters. That was the whole point of this example, is to try to give you know, some number here. So the electrons can have a wavelength on the order of 10 to the minus 11 meters, which is pretty close. In fact, it's smaller than the, uh, the spacing of atoms. So that means that they will definitely diffract. So we'll see this diffraction pattern. 